going to take no for an answer. I'm not going to settle for mediocrity. I'm going to keep pursuing what God put in my heart. You can't be passive and indifferent. You have to have a holy determination. It's more than just your will. It's a fire on the inside, a knowing that it's supposed to be yours. The 20th century is here. Change is here. Newer economic relations, technological forces, and yet, not even happenings old as prehistory, superstitions, spiritual doctrines, were immune to the ever-changing tides of time and history. In the West, Christianity experienced rapid and radical change. With the beginnings of the 20th century, industrialism, technological growth, presenting an ever-changing backdrop that highlighted Christianity's rapid evolution. An evolution highlighting its institutional place amidst rapidly expanding industrial, market-driven capitalist society. With such rapid growth, change, all accelerated beyond what we thought was possible, questions emerge. Why such explosive economic growth now? What caused this, and where do we go from here? To preface, I am particularly excited for this video. There's some topics around intellectual history and philosophy that seem to get only covered on YouTube in an overly concise, watered-down format. This is something I hope to fix. And while Weber's overall thesis is quite simple, there's much, much more hidden relevancy that often gets cast to the quiet side of history here. Aside from all of this, on a personal level, I also find Max Weber to be an incredibly underrated thinker, a hidden character amidst other large 20th century intellectuals. There's a reason Weber is known as a founding member in the field of sociology and the Protestant ethic being a foundational piece within it. So we'll get into it now. This is the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism just in video form. To get a firm understanding of what Weber is doing with this text, we also need to understand the backdrop in which he's working within, and some of the history that he is contending with. First, let's talk about philosophical history. Weber is coming off the tail end of German idealism, arguably the most important philosophical movement since ancient Greece. Being at the tail end, and his interest within understanding the function of industrial capitalism Karl Marx and the shift towards a materialist understanding of society is very important here, and a part of the larger piece of the puzzle that many fail to mention regarding Weber. Okay, to clear up any confusion that inevitably comes with Weber's use of ethic and spirit, it should be noted these are the same things to him. Ethic and spirit is used pretty much synonymously amongst Weber's writing. Weber uses spirit the spirit of capitalism from the perspective of idealism. Yet, he further analyzes this from the perspectives of political economy, social relations, and on the loose form of materialist sociology and philosophy. Now that we understand some of the framework employed by Weber, let's cover some history of Christianity and what has happened up until the early 20th century. This brings us to the Reformation, a time during the 16th century when Christianity and its institutional grounding in Western Europe became quite fractured. During this time, the Catholic Church and the papacy were challenged. A mass call for reform led by individuals such as Martin Luther, a call that swept across Europe and played a massive role in coming events, events such as the Thirty Years' War. Here we saw Christianity and Western Europe split between the traditional Catholic institution and the newly forged framework of Protestantism. And within this newer Protestantism, newer branches formed within it. We saw groups form such as Baptism, Lutheranism, and most important to Weber, Calvinism. So what's so important about Calvinism? It's here that Protestantism did something that caused a permanent ripple through history to Weber, one that shaped economic forces to come. Weber starts the Protestant work ethic with the question of social stratification, religious denomination, and lifestyle. He posits an immediate question at the beginning of the book. Even in Catholic circles, why are so many Protestants overrepresented in business ownership, capital, and higher strata craftsmanship? 
He contends with the prospect of history here. Perhaps this is the socioeconomic result of post-Reformation Europe or the fall of the Holy Roman Empire. Perhaps it's social isolation from predominantly Catholic circles, one that causes Protestants to adapt and bring together newer ideas within a given market. But as many of you have guessed, or simply know, Weber finds another idea more likely. So when we talk about Catholicism, the traditional Western organization to Christianity, the institutions themselves are key to salvation, compliance to doctrine within clerical authority. Here, Protestantism sought to decentralize that process. But not only did it seek to decentralize Christianity's form, but radically change its content characteristics away from traditional asceticism and disconcern with mere worldly affairs. Traditional Catholic piety wasn't concerned with material on an individual level. Thus, to be consumed by materiality was approached very cautiously. To Weber, Calvinism of all denominations was the very beginning of this ever infamous Protestant work ethic. To Weber, the locust for this ethic is derived from the belief of double predestination within Calvinism. The founder of Calvinism, John Calvin, famously said, By predestination we mean the eternal decree of God, by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of these ends, we say that he has been predestined to life or to death. While amidst theological debate, this contrasts the often traditional, typical belief that God predetermines our fate for us. Thus, Calvinists must make up for this newfound free will within the material world. If our salvation is not only in God's hands, but in our own, how might we ensure safe passage into the afterlife? Weber posits one of the Protestant solutions, that being work. To the Calvinist directive, wealth, work, shows a type of engagement within the community. It shows the grand weight of the individual, a weight that shows your Christian worth, worthy of eternal salvation. This derived from Martin Luther's concept of calling, that a faithful dedication to one's labor is the ticket to salvation. Weber points out that there is also an austere way in which many Protestants use their wealth. They may not have ideologically shunned materiality, but they forbade a type of waste, which to them was spending on luxuries, giving to the poor, or accumulation of religious iconography. Thus, we saw a newer secular view of wealth accumulation. That is this very ethic right here. It's a mass sociological change, a flipping in how we view wealth accumulation. The traditional spirit was one of working to live. The new capitalist spirit is living to work. A very spirit derived from Luther's calling and John Calvin's dual predestination. This change, the view of looking at wealth as an end in itself can be seen as a huge beginning in abstract venture investment capital in a contemporary context. To emphasize how fairly prophetic Weber's thesis was, let's look at the 20th century. Credit became central in institutions. The gold standard was abolished in favor of fiat money and the rapid expansion of venture capital as a whole a wealth accumulation that was very passive and abstract, away from any material semblance. To Weber, this ethic changed everything and forced a relinquishing of traditional religious aesthetics that permanently changed how society functioned and interacted. In my mind, these are the pretty genius and significant connections Max Weber made with capitalism and liberalism as a sociological political system amidst entrenched Protestantism. It's here to Weber that the ideological locus of radical Western individualism took shape, a shape that molded emerging society to come. So this is where most explanations of Weber's The Protestant Ethic often end, as it explains Weber's idea of an origin of capitalism. This is what he has been known for, but there is overlooked subtext between the pages that should be highlighted. 
Weber's significance, in my mind, is the intellectual backdrop he is contending with and the changes that played a role in reshaping later theory. Weber coins the origin of modern capitalism within the shifting realm of religious ideals, something based upon fluid, religious, ideological changes in the first place. This is incredibly important because this type of conclusion contrasts the realm of positivism, which Weber approached with extreme skepticism. Positivism posits the general view that knowledge, society, and even the physical realm operate on a set of laws. People and other sociologists such as Auguste Comte and Durkheim had since ushered positivism into a period of mainstream academic praise. But during the time of Weber's writing, we started to see positivism start to fracture. Weber undeniably played a large, overlooked role in emerging 20th century philosophy, a philosophy that often combated this very type of positivism. From the beginnings of critical theory to larger post-structuralist philosophy. But Weber's process and significance doesn't end here. We briefly stated that the Protestant ethic stood in the form of material analysis, yet his conclusion stood as a newer asterisk to Marx's theory of historical materialism, at least partly, and it's an interesting asterisk at that. Weber sees an ideal, a spirit, as something that negates the dualistic Marxist economic theory of base and superstructure. Base as the economic production, resources, engine of society, with the superstructure being the culture, ideological underpinnings. It's here Weber sees this ethic and spirit as something that cuts through this duality. The early progress of such new ideas is, however, beset by many more obstacles than the theoreticians of the superstructure assume. They do not blossom like a flower. The capitalist spirit in the sense in which we have hitherto understood it has had to prove itself in a hard struggle against a world of hostile forces. A way of thinking like that expressed by Benjamin Franklin was applauded by an entire nation. But in ancient or medieval times, it would have been denounced as an expression of the most filthy avarice and of an absolutely contemptible attitude. Weber speaks upon the idea that this very capitalist spirit was present throughout different societies, societies that predated any capitalist systems. This type of spirit faced its own struggles through history. This spirit, force, will, was independent of socioeconomic circumstances. This is incredibly important when understanding the origins of society, religion, or even knowledge. To highlight this, the Marxist understanding of religion or ideology is that it's a direct byproduct of the economic situation and system they are embedded in. While not completely outright rejecting this, Weber does have some qualms on the grounds that this identifying spirit transcended these systems of the past. Yet Weber does not, I repeat, does not reject materialism on the thesis of material process and religious change. Don't get your hopes up here, for all who need the relevant language to be able to sigh a final breath away from the materialist analysis of the 19th century. Weber may not be the one for you. Weber states, Modern man, on the whole, is rarely able, with the best will in the world, to imagine just how significant has been the influence of religious consciousness on conduct of life, culture, and national character. However, it cannot, of course, be our purpose to replace a one-sided materialist causal interpretation of culture and history with an equally one-sided spiritual one. Both are equally possible. This is what often gets missed with Weber from the perspective of materialism. To me, the most fascinating thing about Weber is how he navigates between very rigid philosophical frameworks. In my mind, it feels like without Weber, we wouldn't have the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. We wouldn't have had later theory around capitalism in the vein of Baudrillard. It's an odd connection, but one that I see. Weber's identification of the abstraction of capital to Baudrillard's view of consumption away from materiality, necessity, and into the imaginary and symbolic. Identification in quasi-religion around certain brands. Even though Baudrillard differs from Weber's ascetic thesis of the capitalist spirit, 
given Baudrillard sees new consumption in the 20th century to be the driver of capitalism, Weber seems like the beginnings of understanding contemporary capitalism under the vein of worship in new religious iconography. Religious iconography in the way of brands and corporations in the image. Their framework is the same. Both Baudrillard and Weber see capitalism as something becoming more abstract and materially distant from the past. Weber may be primarily remembered as a sociologist and a historical light, but his connection throughout the humanities is something that doesn't get enough credit. For that, and his prophetic understanding of emerging capitalism, Weber to me stands as one of the most underrated thinkers in the 20th century. Thank you all for watching and making it to the end. As is needed in this YouTube space, I want to make a request for all still watching. If ever possible, do consider pledging a few bucks a month on Patreon, as it is the main thing that keeps this channel alive. To all on screen who support, thanks so much. For the highlighted extra who go above and beyond, that being Kate and Tona, an extra special thank you from me personally. I really enjoy Weber, and here's to hoping above all else, everyone else here enjoyed.